Good morning. Tom, Tom, and Sherry Green are here with us today. You guys are going to enjoy that, believe me. But they're kind of like I am. As soon as you put a microphone on, everything screws up. <laughs> right? All right, we'll get it figured out here sooner or later. Well, welcome to Freedom Ranch on Labor Day weekend. You know, I was wondering, Sandy told me that there wouldn't be many people here today. Because I was thinking about you guys coming, you know. And I said, well, whoever shows up is going to get blessed. <laughs> I'll guarantee you that. And, of course, I have to be here because I live here. Sandy told me I had to come to church today. And I was whining and said, why do I have to go? It's raining outside. She said, you're the pastor, that's why. I'm just kidding around. Actually, I was waiting for Tom to show up. <laughs> oh, he's, he's up there talking. He's all right, Sherry, I see him. I see him. I'm going to talk for a while first. Now, Tom and Sherry are going to do music with, with us this morning and um, their group, and then... After we eat, we're going to have that sanctified pig here, a little ham today. And after we eat, uh, they've agreed to do a little more music for you. So uh, if y'all want to stick around, eat our dinner on the ground, and then have a little enjoyment of music, I know that'll be good to you today. This morning I want to start our service with a word of prayer, obviously, as we always do. But here lately, I've been thinking, you know, a lot about prayer. And other than coming to the conclusion that, you know, I've lived long enough and I guess I've done enough prayers to realize that God doesn't listen to me very often. Now, I hate to break that to those of you who expect me to pray for you and you get all kinds of stuff, all kinds of blessings, but yeah, he doesn't do what I tell him to do. And frankly, that just kind of pisses me off. Because after all, I've dedicated my life to serving him. Now, when you dedicate your life to serving someone, That means you're going to be a slave. And nowhere in human history has any slave ever commanded their master to do anything. It's always reversed, did you know that? It's always the master telling the slave what to do. So when I stop and think, well, I've dedicated my life to your service, it begins to dawn on me why he doesn't do what I tell him to do. What he does is what's best for me and for everybody else, regardless of what I tell him to do. Now, I try. That doesn't never stop me from letting him know exactly what I want. In fact, his word tells us, you know, to come boldly before the throne of grace and to let our requests be made known unto him. You know, and so it's okay. We can tell him everything we want. But how many of you know there's a difference between telling God what you would like to have, what you want, and telling him what to do? There's a big heart difference there, isn't there? And that heart difference is faith. See, if I pray in faith, then I, I know that, number one, God already knows what I need. He already knows what I want. And he already knows what's best for me. And if I believe he's my father, which I really do, my heavenly father, then I believe he's going to do what's best for me no matter how much I kick and scream, no matter how many fits I throw on the floor. Now that doesn't stop me from throwing a fit occasionally. I'll, I'll do that. Doesn't stop me from getting mad at him. I think the most absurd thing is try to hide from God when you're mad at him. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? 
God who knows everything and everybody and knows all about everything, and you're going to try to, quote, hide from him? That doesn't work. If I get honest with him, like my daddy, and trust him, and say, Lord, I trust you. So a lot of my prayers are scrunched down to that prayer Jesus prayed in the garden. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So I want you to join me in prayer as we start this morning. And we'll ask God to accomplish his will in our lives. Let's pray together. Father God, as we come into your presence, I thank you and I praise you. That we can call you our Father. And that we can come boldly before your throne of grace. Not based on our merit, but on the merit of your Son, Jesus, whom you made us to be just like. And so as we come before you as your children, Father, we have burdens on our heart. We have concerns. We have problems. We have difficulties. We've got all kinds of things we think you need to do. We trust you with those, Father. We trust you to do what's right, what's best for us and for everyone else because you are our Father. So we thank you, Father, for the privilege that we have to talk to you and to hear from you. And we thank you for your son, Jesus. And Lord Jesus, we welcome you now to this church in the woods as the head of this church. You're not here as a guest. We want you to take over through your spirit, working in the hearts and minds of each person here, that you would accomplish what would bring honor and glory to the Father, that you would do through us and for us what only you can do. These things we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. All right, while you're calming down a little bit, let me make an announcement or two. I did go chastise the kids, by the way. I said, what is this? Man, I look forward to this all week long. They said, well, it was raining. We couldn't play on the playground, so... They wanted to go in and do a craft or something. So, anyhow, I prayed for them. That was one of my highlights of the week. Pray for those little guys. Um, announcements. Monday night's men's meeting at 7 o'clock at Bill Psalms' house. Um, also, Alex, who's not with us today, has a class on Monday night. And while I'm mentioning that, he's starting in October... Uh, he and I are going to co-teach uh, an Alpha series down there in Palm Beach Garden area at the Church of the Nazarene. We're on Monday nights at 7 o'clock. And Alex also teaches down in Palm Beach Gardens at uh, First Baptist Church on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. So you're certainly welcome to go to any of those. Um, we haven't haven't gotten a date for the new Tuesday night class yet. Um, but there's a few things in the works, one of which is uh, uh, the possibility of a Monday night ladies' class. So you all keep that in mind. Uh, 12, uh, we have our 12-step processing class on Thursday evenings. That continues to go on. So our next recovery counseling class is September the 8th, which is next Saturday. Next Saturday, September the 8th, I'll be teaching a class on recovery from trauma. Uh, looking specifically at the issues of post-traumatic stress syndrome, what's called uh, PTSD. Um, and we'll be also looking at some other, not just the symptoms and the problems and all that, but we'll be looking at the recovery from that. Okay, so uh, the biblical recovery from trauma. Ladies, you've got a fall luncheon coming up on October the 27th, so keep that in mind get more information to you here as the time approaches. All right, these are all the announcements I have. Let me uh, get back to Romans chapter 2. We're going to complete chapter 2 today, the Lord willing. I gave you an introduction to it, more or less, last week. And I want to uh, want to revisit this because this is an important important section for the church today. In fact, it's just as vital for the church today as it was when Paul wrote the letter in obscurity two millennia ago. 
is a warning in this section, particularly a warning religious people. Now, I know none of you are religious or ever have been religious. I understand that. And you're certainly not, as the other word, the other word, uh, term for this Greek word that's translated religious means you're certainly not superstitious. But see, in Paul's day, there was a whole bunch of religious folks. In fact, he grew up religious, kind of like me. I think I, was, I might have been born on a church pew. I'm not sure. That's how I got my drug problem. As a child, I was drugged to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday evening, prayer meeting. I know there's just as much religion today in the world as there was in Paul's day, so I think this warning that he gives in the last part of chapter 2 is relevant to all of us as it was in the day he wrote this. So let me, uh, let me read it to you again, and we'll try to get a little better understanding of what he's talking about. Starting in verse 17, we're kind of breaking into the context. He says, Behold, are you called a Jew? Now, for our purposes, you could put in there, are you religious? Are you called a Jew and rest in the law? And makes your boast of God and knows his will and approves the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law. And are confident that thou yourself, you yourself, are a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has a form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Now I want to stop right here and just give you a point of emphasis here. In just these few verses, He's connected religiosity with the law. Okay, in the very first verse, he says, rest in the law. In verse 17. Verse 18, being instructed out of the law. In verse 20, which has a form of, the no of knowledge and of the truth in the law. And I don't want this to go unnoticed. Religious people are always caught up with the law. Now, what do I mean by the law? Well, in Israel's history, you all know that when they came out, miraculously, God delivered them out of a bondage in Egypt. The very first thing they did three days into the wilderness at Mount Sinai was to receive the law. Now, we don't have time, obviously, to do an in-depth study of that. But let me just recap for you. When Moses got the law on Mount Sinai, he was forced to go up to the mountain, up on top of the mountain, because the people were afraid. You talk about shock and awe. They were overwhelmed. Because it was there at Mount Sinai in the wilderness that God gave the greatest revelation of who he was since the creation. He actually spoke from heaven. The entire mountain trembled. People were terrified when God gave the law. Now the law is not just simply a set of rules and regulations. The law is a revelation of who God is, what he demands, what he expects out of humanity. And when he gave that law, they were shocked. But it's ironic that God gave the law to those who were enslaved for 400 years 
to the nobodies in this world. It's a little old tiny nation of a million and a half people, Israel. Of all the people in the world, God shows out this little old group of people who at the time numbered somewhere around a million and a half people. And he gave this great revelation of who he was, who he is, and what he expects to this little old group of people. Now naturally, you can understand that they were not only in awe and shocked, but after they thought about it a while, they got a little proud. Of all the people in the world, God gave us this great revelation, the law. Now when you read the Old Testament scriptures, it's really pre predominantly the history of Israel, starting with Abraham, his calling, going all the way through. But there's one thing that stands out in that history, in Israel's relationship to the law. From the time Moses gave them the law, that little group of people declared before God and everyone, whatever God wants us to do, whatever God expects us to do, however he expects us to live, we'll do it. Now, the first generation that promised that were not able to go into the promised land because they blew it. They blew what the law expected. They couldn't do it. Joshua, one of that generation, who on an individual basis relied upon God, was chosen by God and raised up by him to lead that little nation into the conquest of the promised land. You can read all about that in the book of Joshua. And after their land was secure, after he had won a great victory, he put half of the people on one mountain and the other half on the other mountain, Gerizim and evil and he stood in the valley and he read the law that was given by God to Moses and he called them to obedience he said choose you this day whom you will obey whom you'll serve as for me and my house we're going to serve the Lord you see that stuff on bumper stickers and Christian plaques all the time what you don't see on those bumper stickers and Christian plaques is what the people said. They said, yeah, man, we'll do it, Joshua, no problem. Just tell us what to do and we'll do it. We got this. And Joshua, in an act of mercy, said to them, you can't do it. They said, yeah, yeah, we will. We promise we'll do it. We'll behave ourselves. He said, you can't do it. They persisted so strongly that he finally said, okay, if you want to keep the law, I suggest that you start by putting away the false gods in your tents. See, they were already violating it. Same thing their fathers had done. While Moses was up on the mount getting the Ten Commandments, remember what the people were doing down at the bottom? Making that golden calf and violating all the Ten Commandments. Second generation is about to make the same mistake. So you had the period of the judges. The judges are interesting after they were in the land because true to Joshua's statement, they were never able to keep the law, ever. In fact, Judges, the book of Judges records 13 cycles in which they tried as hard as they could to behave themselves, screwed up, got overcome by their enemies, 
And God had to miraculously raise up a judge to set them free. Just to keep them in the land. He did that 13 times. Same cycle over and over again. Finally, the people decided, looking around, they said, oh, we know why we can't keep the law. This is a no-brainer. Every other nation has a king. We don't have a king. You give us a king, and we'll behave ourselves. So God gave him a king. That is, she did in the periods of kings which was characterized by continuous civil war between the ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes as the kingdom was divided and ended in catastrophic captivities. The ten northern tribes were overrun, taken into captivity by the Assyrians. In case you don't know who the Assyrians were, they were the ancient terrorists. They would make ISIS look like Sunday school kids. That's why Jonah tried his best to get out of going to preach the gospel to them because they were known to skin their enemies alive. They overcame, took into captivity the ten northern tribes of Israel, that northern kingdom. But the southern kingdom didn't fare any better in keeping the law. They were overcome by the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, led by Nebuchadnezzar. Came in, wiped them out took them, hauled them off into captivity. Now, 70 years later, the Jews came back into their native country, back to Jerusalem, by edict of a heathen king. But it wasn't because they learned to keep the law. They learned to behave themselves. That's not the reason they came back into Jerusalem. The reason they came back to Jerusalem was because God had made a promise, an unconditional promise to Abraham, the father of the Jews, and to David that he would preserve the remnant by his grace. So they came back into the land. And while they're rebuilding the temple and while they're rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem, an ingenious little scribe by the name of Ezra discovered the law. Ten Commandments, all statutes and ordinances, ceremony and commands, all of it. And he started reading it. And it dawned on him. No wonder God sent us into captivity. We've never kept the law. So he called everybody together and made a national assembly and said, from now on, we're going to keep the law. We're going to follow what God commands. Everybody says, right on. Amen. We got you. We'll all do it. But he noticed in the fine print there of the law that it was against the law to marry a non-Jewish woman. So he said, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to put away our wives. You can imagine what that did to the whole group, remnant. I'm sure some of them wanted to get rid of their wife anyhow. <laughs> but you can imagine what it did to the wives. Until Malachi came on the scene and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, God hates divorce. See, in their first effort to keep the law, they were screwed up. They didn't understand. They were confused. Now, between Malachi and Matthew, 
is a period of 400 years of history. In that 400-year period, there was a group of spiritual leaders in Israel that rose up called the Hasidim. The Hasidim, also known as separatists, were zealous for the law. And with the history that they've had as a nation, they began thinking about it and said, well, you know how human nature is. You tell somebody, don't do it, and what do they do? It's everything you tell them not to do. We understand human nature. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the Ten Commandments, what God tells us not to do, and we're going to build a hedge of protection around those Ten Commandments. We're going to make up 613 rules and regulations on how not to violate the Ten Commandments. Because after all, human nature says people... You know, if you tell them not to do something, they'll do it. But at least they won't violate the Ten Commandments, and we won't go back into captivity. Those 613 rules and regulations, the majority of which, by the way, concern the one commandment, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, because it was kind of the religious thing to do. Those 613 rules and regulations became what's known as the traditions of the elders. Written in a book for every generation to know. And they even went so far as to devise a method by which they could enforce those 613 rules and regulations. Instead of having people come up to the temple once or twice to three times during the year, in Jerusalem and worship and be taught, they decided, no, no, we need a lot more than this. We're going to keep these people straight. They're going to have to be hammered weekly on the Sabbath. In order to do that, we're going to have to create what's known as synagogues in every town or village. And in that synagogue, there's going to be this ornate chair that's called Moses' seat. Because every Saturday, the law is going to be read. And this will keep the people from misbehaving. And a genius plan. The only problem with it was, again, it didn't work. You see, the Hasidim, who developed the tradition of the elders, who developed the synagogue system, became the Pharisees of Jesus' day. Which explains their hostility when he didn't abide by their traditions of the elders. And those Pharisees, the religious spiritual leaders of Israel, far from obeying and impressing God with their obedience to his law, rejected his only begotten son, cried, crucify him. We don't need him. We got our system. And he's rocking the boat. Let's get rid of him. Now, with that background in mind, Paul's saying, okay, I got you. You're all hooked into the law, the knowledge of what's right and wrong. I got you. You got a special revelation from God. You've read the Old Testament. You've read the commands in the New Testament. I got you. You who think you can teach other people because you have such an inside scoop on God derived from your book of rules and regulations. See, here's where the religious connection really comes in, folks. People use this Bible not as a sword, a sharp two-edged sword of the Spirit, but they use it as a club to beat other people over the head with for not living up to the standards revealed by the law. They look at it as a rule book. 
not a revelation of who God really is. The living word. And anytime you start looking at it as a rule book, and you try to live up to it, you make the same silly mistake Israel made. That's what Paul's point is. So he asks, okay, you are going to instruct everybody because you've got knowledge of good and evil from the rules in the Bible. You are going to tell people how to behave, how to live, what's right and what's wrong. Do you follow it yourself? You who tell people it's against the law to steal, are you ripping other people off? You who say it's against the law to commit adultery, do you have a little problem with those sexual perverted thoughts you've got in your mind you can't get rid of? You who condemn pagans for worshiping other gods. Are you worshiping your money, your possessions, your stuff, your position? Now with those rhetorical questions, he causes us to stop and think just how effective is our religious efforts to behave ourselves. Just how good is it? Just how good are you behaving? See, when Jesus came on the scene to that same group of people, he gave this sermon on the Mount. Famous Sermon on the Mount, recorded in Matthew 5 through 7. And there he explained that it's not good enough just not to kill your brother. You see, thou shalt not kill is not fulfilled by simply not choking someone to death. If you've got hatred in your heart, you've murdered him already. Same way with adultery. It's not good enough you pride yourself in the fact that you haven't jumped on your neighbor's wife. Congratulations. That's not good enough. If you got lust in your heart for another, you committed adultery already. See, Jesus moved the external standards of the law to the inside. And while he said, you can put on the dog on the outside, it's that inside that's going to get you. So Paul, as he goes on to explain here, says, you're making your boast of God, of the law, but you're breaking it yourself. Have you ever noticed how self-righteous people, I mean, people other than you, I understand, but have you ever noticed how self-righteous people are quick to harangue on people that are doing stuff that are wrong, but they're absolutely blind to their own faults, their own issues. Have you ever noticed, as Jesus said, how that, that people will have trouble with the little minute details? And you violating the little minute details, but they themselves are committing the worst possible crime. He called it straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel. You see, religious folks have this problem and have had this problem ever since Israel and before. So Paul is very concerned that we get this message that what we do or don't do according to our understanding and efforts to keep the law, the rules, you're going to get the job done. As a matter of fact, what happens is the same thing that Israel did, and that is, he calls it, let me read it to you in his terms, verse 24, he says, for the name of God, his identity of who God is, is blasphemed 
among the Gentiles. Among the people that never had the law, among the people that know anything about God, the name of God, his identity, his true identity is blasphemed. By what? By your religious self-righteousness. Now, in order to help us understand that, he gives us gives us some insight in these verses that I told you last week were a King James mouthful. I'm just going to read them to you in the King James first. And then I'm going to read a little interpretation I did for you to try to help make it understandable. He goes on to say in verse 25, For circumcision verily profited, if you keep the law. But if you be a breaker of the law, your circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keeps the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge you, who by the letter and circumcision transgress the law? For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is he that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Now again, I know that's King James' mouthful, it's a little hard to understand, a little hard to really derive what he's driving at here. So let me give you a, my own version, all right? My own version is a little different than these verses, verses 25 through 29. See, pleasing God is, not, is a matter of the heart, in the spirit, not in our meticulous keeping of the letter of the law. That's the general idea. So I might translate this section a little different for a modern Christian reader. It goes something like this. For church attendance is profitable if you keep the law. But if you do not keep the law, your church attendance is the same as not attending. Therefore, if those who do not attend church regularly actually love other people? Shouldn't this non-attending crowd be counted as attending church? And shouldn't those who do not go to church, which is the natural course, if they love others, judge you who go to church every week to make yourself righteous? but do not love other people like Christ? For he is a Christian who is one inwardly. And going to church is a matter of love led by the Spirit and not just compliance to the rules to please men. How many of you have heard that the church is full of hypocrites? You ever hear that? Sure you have. Now that's not the only place hypocrites go. Okay. There's hypocrites around you everywhere, especially in the political realm, and I'm gonna go there. <laughs> However, where does this accusation come from? Church is full of hypocrites. It comes from that religious spirit, that religious mentality that is focused on your own effort to make yourself behave. Because while you are worried about your sin and whether or not you are pleasing to God, while you are consumed and focused on your own spiritual condition before God, you don't give a rusty rat's butt about anybody else. You can't. You can't love anybody when you're worried about you. That religious spirit is what gives Christianity a bad name, guys. Did you know that? 
they're too busy trying to make themselves righteous to care about anybody else. To actually love somebody. And yet, what's one command Jesus left us with? Hmm? A new command I give unto you. You want to fulfill the law? Then love other people like Christ. In fact, Paul tells us later in Romans 13 that when you love another like Christ, you fulfill all the law. Jesus said, this new commandment is that you're to love others like Christ, like he does, which is supernatural, I realize. He doesn't say it like the Old Testament said, love your neighbor as yourself, because some of you don't even like yourself. He says, you love other people just like Christ loves them. That requires supernatural power. It can only come from him. Now, there are a whole bunch of people in today's world. They go to church regularly. They get baptized. They do all kinds of rituals. They do all kinds of things. And Why are they doing it? Well, I hope I can please God. I hope I fulfill the law so he'll bless me and at least not curse me. That's not Christianity, folks. That's a religious perversion. See, Christianity is a matter of love. Love you have for the Father, love he had for you first, you for him second, and you for others, just like Christ. That's why I call it the critical event. There's no matter what else goes on. I don't care what kind of preaching you have, what kind of singing you have, what kind of activities you have, don't have. No matter what else goes on, what God wants is for us to love one another more than anything else. Now, Paul's given us serious indictments here in these first two chapters. He's going to conclude that in chapter 3, in the first part of chapter 3, and he's going to tell us there are none righteous, no, not one. He's going to say we've all blown it. None of us kept the law, etc., etc. No matter who you are, no matter where you came from, it doesn't matter. This is humanly impossible. And then he's going to break out with the gospel. The good news. Here's the good news. God has done for you what you couldn't do for yourself. What you couldn't do for yourself by trying to follow the rules and regulations, God did. He made you righteous by his own act, by what he believes about you. Now, we'll get into that a little later. But as we close our service this morning, I want us to engage in another one of those church rituals it's called communion. While the men are going to prepare the elements, I wanted to just share with you a little bit about how are we going to observe communion without being religious? You know, I've sat in communion services before when, while they're getting ready for it and preparing the preacher, quoting out of Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11, he says, now you all be careful. If you got unconfessed sin in your life and you eat and drink these elements and you're going to wind up eating and drinking damnation unto yourself. And you laid a guilt trip on us. Taking out of context what Paul was saying about communion. After telling us that Communion was established by Jesus as a memorial meal, kind of like Passover, because it was established during the Passover when he observed the Passover meal with his disciples in the upper room. <coughs> At the end, when he took the cup of blessing, he established this new memorial meal. See, Passover was the celebration of Passover was a Jewish celebration of their deliverance from bondage from Egypt, God doing for them what they couldn't do for themselves. 
And Jesus took the last cup of that Passover meal and he instituted this new memorial meal. He says, taking the cup, this is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for the remission of sins many. Now the new covenant implies that there was an old covenant. And obviously there was an old covenant. You're all fully aware and absolutely conscious of the old covenant. You may not think of it in those terms, but you are. But you've been raised under it. The old covenant said this with regards to God and his relationship to you. If you behave yourself, if you do what I tell you to do, and if you don't do what I tell you not to do, I'll bless you. Kind of sounds like the law, doesn't it? Because after all, how are you going to know what to do and not do? Well, you read the law. It's right there. That's how you know what to do and what not to do. I gave up reading the law a long time ago because I've discovered that I already know more of what to do than I'm able to do. And I already know more of what not to do than I can keep myself from doing. And I'm sure you've got the same problem. See, it's not a matter of knowing what to do or not do. That's why I reject the notion that preachers ought to preach against sin like people don't know they're sinning. <laughs> I, I've never known anybody that didn't know they were sinning. I know a whole bunch of people that didn't know how to quit. But they knew that what they were doing. It wasn't for lack of knowledge. You see, the Old Covenant says it's conditional. Condition upon your ability, your promise. The Old Covenant says, if you keep the rules, if you know the rules and keep the rules, God will bless you. But Jesus said, no, this isn't the Old Covenant. This is a new covenant. God made a new covenant. Now Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, all those boys, they all prophesied the new covenant. I like what Jeremiah had to say about it. He said, inasmuch as you couldn't keep the old covenant, he told Israel. You couldn't make yourself behave. I'm going to make a new covenant with you. And the conditions of the new covenant are radically different. Since you can't behave, I'm going to write my law in your hearts and I'm going to put it in your inward parts. Essentially, I'm going to make you behave from the inside out. Secondly, you're not going to have a need that somebody tell you about me because I'm going to talk to you personally. You're going to be my people. I'm going to be your God. We're going to have a close, personal, intimate relationship. And finally, he said, your sins and your iniquities, all the times you've screwed up, you've blown it, I'll remember no more. Now, that one always got me. I said, how in the world could God forget all the times I screwed up. I mean, he could forgive me. I can understand that. But forget? See, if you do something against me, I might be able to forgive you. But I'll never forget you did it. How could God do that? Then it dawned on me what the full impact of that new covenant is all about. What we'll be studying about more in Romans later on. The reason God forgets all your sins and your iniquities is because he, by his grace, through his power, makes you a brand new person that never has once sinned against him. That's his new covenant, grace. So that's what we're celebrating here this morning. We're not doing it to earn God's favor. We're not doing it to hopefully make up for our sins. We're doing it as an act of faith. And what God has done for us, we couldn't do for ourselves in the new covenant. On that night before Jesus was crucified, he took the cup, saying, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is being shed for the remission of the sins of many. 
And he took the bread, and when he said, this is my body being broken for you. Now, he wasn't talking about that physical body that hung on the cross. He was talking about this body here, the spiritual body. His spiritual body is broken down into little segments that we can actually feel, and touch, and see the body of Christ. Broken into elements. Small groups of other believers that we can actually relate to. Through his blood, we have the forgiveness of sins. Through his body, we have fellowship with him. Through the blood and body of Christ, the new covenant is fulfilled in our faith. So this morning, I'm going to bless these elements, and I want you to come and partake. As we do so, let's pray together. Father God, as we come into your presence, we're so grateful. We're so grateful for that new covenant, the new covenant of grace that you've made with us, that you have done for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. We celebrate that here this morning through this memorial meal we're about to partake of. I ask you, Lord, to make it real to us through your spirit. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you come and receive the elements, please? On the night Jesus first instituted this meal with his disciples, he said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So what we're doing here today is remembering what Jesus has done for us. The fact that through his death, he crucified that old person we were, incapable of keeping the law. And through his resurrection, he created a brand new person. So that that's the real person we are now. Lord Jesus, we remember you. And all the people said, Amen and Amen. Why don't you all stick around? We're going to be opening the doors and serve a little ham. Got a meal prepared for you. Tom and Sherry will be doing a little music this afternoon, so you all are welcome to stick around. Enjoy it. <laughs>